The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents a debate review, Did Jesus Fulfill Prophecy with Matt Delaney and Sam Nesson. So I did this debate just a couple of weeks ago uh, on modern day debates. And towards the end of this, I'll be talking about whether or not I'll be continuing to participate with modern day debates as kind of a bonus to the review. But it ties into a number of problems. Um, but let's start with this debate in particular. This is actually, I was excited for this debate. It's the first time anybody has asked me to debate on whether or not Jesus fulfilled prophecy. Uh, we've debated all kinds of things surrounding this issue, and I've definitely dealt with the prophecy question on episodes of the atheist experience. But to have a proper public debate about whether or not Jesus fulfilled prophecy, I was excited. And what I found, um, as is the case min most of the time lately uh, when I'm debating in this online thing with modern day debates, I was disappointed. Um, because what I wanted, when I prepare for a debate, when I look at this issue of prophecy, I'm preparing for the topic, not the person. I find that there's too many people who are preparing for the person. Like for example, in a week or so, I have a debate on the resurrection with Trent Horn, who I know virtually nothing about. Um, I don't want to prejudice myself by going in knowing things about Trent and preparing for Trent. I've talked about this before, to prepare for the topic and not for the person. I think it's a mistake to prepare for the person. That doesn't mean you shouldn't know, you know, it hurts to know something about them. I've debated people I know well, like Blake and I have debated many times. But when I'm going to debate prophecy, I start asking myself questions. Number one, how do we identify what is or isn't a prophecy? Because some statements um, very clearly are a prediction of the future. Uh, someday there will be a woman president. That's an example I, I use quite frequently. Other statements, like, for example, the, the passage from Isaiah 53, it's not clear that this is intended to be uh, a prophecy. A lot of people view it that way, but more after the fact view it that way. That the suffering servant, they say, wow, this sounds a lot like Jesus. That must have been a prophecy of Jesus. So, when you're looking at prophecy, you want to know, A, how do we know that this is in fact a prophecy? Is it making a clear prediction? Is it making a prediction of a future event? And how would we know exactly which future event is likely to fulfill it? So if I walk into a restaurant and I order a steak medium rare and they bring me a medium rare steak, as I pointed out, they're not fulfilling prophecy. That's an order. That's a directive. And so the same thing is kind of true with various predictions about Israel as a nation state. If you have an entire group of people and, in, and perhaps many nations working towards making this a reality, that's about them working to bring about something that they think is important. It doesn't mean that there's a, a, a prediction that was made uh, with foresight. It was more of an instruction. And so you know, we need to be able to differentiate between an instruction, you know, like, hey, the house of Israel, so never fall. And so you keep this little nation state, even if it's just a t you know one house uh, type thing. Or you have predictions that are a little more specific. And then we have to look and say, okay, if we have this prediction made, um, how do we tell what events count as a fulfillment of that prediction? So you can pick up your local newspaper and go to the uh, horoscope section where whoever your newspaper horoscope writer is, is essentially, well, they're not even making predictions so much about the future as they are making advice suggestions. Today, be on the lookout for a man in blue. Something amazing will happen to you. And then after the fact, because this is kind of like a Barnum statement, you know, outside of a pandemic, I'm likely to run across someone in blue. But if I go the whole day and I never have that encounter that changes my life, I just ignore it. The prophecy, you know, is like, oh, well, maybe that wasn't for me, or maybe I missed it, or maybe something went wrong. But the second something happens that seems to match what that horoscope was for the day, all of a sudden that gets counted as a hit. And so our, pro our process is to remember and overemphasize the hits, the things that appear to be uh, accurate predictions, and to ignore the misses. It's like, you know, if you've been thinking about someone, and the phone rings, and it's them... People look at that as if you got a premonition, but did you actually keep a diary and log in every time you've thought about that person and the phone didn't ring 
<laughs> and how many times the phone rang and you were thinking about someone or you weren't thinking about someone. It's difficult to show that there could possibly be a connection there. And so I don't find horoscopes particularly impressive. And when you go to air quotes, psychic readers, tarot card readers, etc., these are more about personality reading type things and they're really vague. It's rare that you get someone who's saying, I'm making predictions for the coming year. Now, some of the bigger air quotes psychics will do exactly that. And then nobody really cares when their success rate is kind of abysmal. And they will make predictions that could be fulfilled by a number of different instances. Like sometime in March, there will be a magnitude 7.2 earthquake. Well, when you take a look at how many earthquakes are actually happening all the time, every day, um, it's inevitable that you're going to get stuff like that right. But we're talking about something like biblical prophecy. And for me, this was an incredibly interesting topic. The first point is that the Jews were waiting for, were and are waiting for a messianic figure. And they have a very particular notion of what that messianic figure is going to be like, which is why, generally speaking, apart from messianic Jews, uh, Jews don't think Jesus fulfilled prophecy. They don't think Jesus was God. They think he was a false prophet. And I mentioned this during the debate because it's the Jewish prophecies that we're looking at that are supposedly being fulfilled. And in some cases, it's not even Jewish prophecies. What's happened is somebody wrote a story about a Jesus character, and somebody else goes back and goes and starts reading in the Old Testament and finds passages that they can make sound and feel like it happened with Jesus. And therefore, you can look at this after the fact and say, oh, clearly this was a prophecy, and Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. The problem is, is that it wasn't viewed necessarily as a prophecy before the uh, the backward facing look of, hey, doesn't this sound a lot like Jesus? Um, it isn't considered prophecy of the messianic figure on behalf of the Jews who they who were expecting a a warrior champion to restore Israel to its you know glory as God's chosen people and all this other stuff. And so I set up for this debate going. All I want is an example of one clear, unambiguous prophecy that was clearly written before the events and the specific event that you think uh, is the fulfillment of that prophecy, the thing that came true. And this shouldn't be subject to interpretation uh, and it shouldn't be subject, it shouldn't be very ambiguous. And I, I didn't really expect, and we didn't get the born of a virgin thing, but that would at least be extraordinary. If you said, there's a future Messiah who will be born of a virgin. Okay, well, that's not really what the passage in Isaiah says, but that's how it was interpreted, and, and, and I would argue misinterpreted, which is why uh, this whole virgin birth narrative probably began. And that's what raises a number of problems. Here's a passage in the Old Testament let's say 10 passages in the, in the Old Testament, in the Torah, in the, in, the, in the Jewish Bible. And two of them, the Jews looked at as being prophetic of a Messiah. And the other eight were only viewed as prophetic interpretation or prof prophecies after the fact. Like when they, when they were writing the story, Jesus was like, oh, let's go back. Oh, look, look, here's this thing in Hosea that sounds a lot like it's talking about uh, a savior and we'll claim that prophecy and go with it. Here's the problem. My opponent kept, I, I repeatedly asked, give me an example. One prophecy that is clear and unambiguous that was answered by a single circumstance. And he wouldn't do it. He couldn't do it. The closest he came was to just say Isaiah 53, this passage about the long-suffering servant sounds a lot like Jesus. And I'm like, well, that's cool because you're seeing that after the fact. But was that you know identified and identifiable as a prophecy before those events occurred? And we didn't really get that. We also didn't have any demonstration that Jesus actually fulfilled anything. What we have is, here's a story, which we can't verify the specifics of, that claims this person met this criteria. And here's another story in a different book, ages old, that if you kind of tilt your head to the side and squint and look, a little bit, it kind of looks like it might refer to this, but nobody looked at it as, oh, here's our savior. 
if I were up for the James Randi Educational Foundation's million dollar prize as a psychic who could predict the future, none of these would earn me the million dollar prize. None of them would earn me even a passing grade on an initial test. None of these predictions are specific. They're not testable. They're not impressive. It is only to the people who begin with the belief that Jesus was divine and was the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, who then go back and look at these things afterwards where they kind of like, oh yeah, and oh, and oh, it's this and this and this, and then they will believe anything. They'll believe a virgin birth because, hey, this other thing was right. They'll believe this. As soon as you start saying, yes, that looks like prophecy, then all of a sudden you start seeing the answers to prophecy everywhere. So throughout the debate, not a single clear identifiable prophecy that would pass any reasonable test. And that was pretty frustrating because all we got, and at one point I think we, we said something, I'll paraphrase this, but I'm like, look, if, if all you're going to say is you believe that he fulfilled prophecy, but you can't prove it, then we're wasting time. We're wasting everybody's time because you believe and I don't. If, if what you say, if what you're saying is I, you believe the Bible and I don't, then we're stuck. What you need to do is convince me that the Bible, your understanding of the Bible is actually correct. And if you're going to make the claim that Jesus fulfilled prophecy, you have to make a case for it. There was no case made. And so this opportunity to debate the whether or not Jesus fulfilled prophecy was, as far as I can tell, entirely wasted. Uh, and it gets worse. During this debate, for those of you who, who watched it, uh, not only did my opponent just flat out suggest that I was entirely closed-minded and nothing that he said would ever convince me, essentially that I'm too skeptical, which was a character attack in the middle of a debate where all I was asking was for one freaking example. Here's a prophecy. Here's the event that fulfilled it. We didn't get that. We didn't get anything even in the ballpark of that. And as I exposed this over and over and the flawed understanding of epistemology, of course, the chat going along with uh, the chat at Modern Day Debates is a cesspool. I hope, I'm hoping they're fixing it. I was called a Nazi. I'm mocked all the time. I show up prepared to actually discuss the subject and have a conversation about it. And all my opponents want to do there is preach. Now, Modern Day Debates has like a little tag that I didn't even notice for the first few debates. It's like usually in the upper corner up here somewhere or something where debaters come to die. And okay, I guess that's the new... YouTube, oh, let's be edgy. Ah, where debaters come to die. Well, it turns out to be more accurate than they ever suspected. Uh, because in the towards the end of this debate, I announced that it was the last time that I would be debating at Modern Day Debates. That may change if they clean up their chat and if they try to make sure that they're raising the bar. But the truth is, if you go look at Modern Day Debates videos, um, for most of the debates, including ones that my opponents are in, there's a few thousand views, a few thousand views, a few thousand views. And I show up and there's 10, 20, 50, 90, 100, 200,000 views, et cetera, like that. If I am showing up and drawing attention to the Modern Day Debates platform, and it turns out that when I'm not on the Modern Day, deba deba debates, modern day debates platform, it devolves into two random YouTubers bickering about whether hashtag all lives matter, hashtag black lives matter, you know, uh, should we be Nazis? Uh, does Captain Crunch, Crunch Berries contain cardboard, whatever. And nobody's paying attention to it. Then I'm drawing attention to a platform um, that perhaps I shouldn't be. The problem is I like the moderator, even, you know, I like how he generally stays off of things. I like the fact that I'm able to do debates. And by the way, I get paid for those. I'm one of the few people, I may be the only person there that's actually getting paid for the debates. And so that's kind of the makeup for, hey, you're going to get a prominent debater and to bring credibility to your platform and you're going to pay for that. I mean, this is how I make my living or one of the ways. But if I'm the only credible debater there, and I'm not saying that's necessarily the case, but it's close. Um, and on any given day, I'm the only one showing up to address the subject. Because if you go back to the last two debates, 
I was the only one that was prepared to really talk about prophecy. My opponent didn't give a single prophecy in, in clarity to say, here's a prophecy, here's how we know it's a prophecy, here's what happened, and here's how we know this is the fulfillment of prophecy, and why this event fulfilled prophecy, but no other event could, because prophecy needs to be answerable by a single circumstance. Otherwise, it's like my prediction that eventually the United States will have a woman president. But I, you don't say eventually, you just say, the United States will have a woman as president. And then eventually when it happens, you can say, see, I was right. And, and you can get gradually more specific. And as long as you aren't so specific that you're going to be debunked, like if I don't say in 2024, uh, or a redheaded, uh, oh, actually you could probably do hair because people change the color of their hair at different times. But this is how you look at the quatrains of Nostradamus and people say, ah, look, here's this. It's clearly answered by this. I mean, look at how prophetic this guy was. And I'll say this, uh, Nostradamus' quatrains being ambiguous and subject to interpretation, they're still slightly more impressive than any of the predictions and prophecies that are identified in the Bible because you can at least show what did or didn't happen. Everything else is a storybook telling what another storybook got right or wrong or what they suspect got right or wrong. And the author of the, of the Gospel of Matthew seemed to just invent prophecies out of whole cloth so that he could claim more prophecies. It was a big deal. If your Messiah doesn't answer a whole bunch of prophecies, uh, we're not paying any attention to him. No, no, no. He was this, this was foretold that there would be a long-suffering servant and all this other stuff. But Sam, who's a nice guy, and I, apart from his character attack on me, um, I'd be happy to have a discussion with him about something else, didn't really defend the proposition. And if you go back a debate before that where we talked about Pascal's wager, Sal didn't really defend the proposition. That's a big deal. Why on earth am I continuing to show up and do these debates and be the only one that's putting the effort in? Because Sal just showed up to preach and then throw Pascal's wager on at the end. And Sam just showed up to say, I believe the Bible and here's what the Bible says and didn't defend any notion about prophecy or prediction or fulfillment or anything. And if that's gonna be the case continually, and in addition to that, I'm gonna to have to sit there and be accosted in chat talking about how I'm an idiot or the Dillahunty Dodge or the, none of that bothers me or offends me because you can call me whatever names you want. It's irritating in the moment because I care deeply about having these conversations and, and I want to know the truth and I want to have good discussions with people. And yeah, I don't take any shit. I'm going to call out fallacies and bullshit everywhere I find it and always will. But if the people in the audience are just laughing and jeering and mocking. It doesn't offend me. You can call me whatever name you want. Oh, Matt's a soy boy cook. And it says far more about who you are and who the chat is. The problem is, is that when the chat's like that, is anybody getting anything out of this? When we have a, a one-two punch of one person in this debate is refusing to address the topic, and most or a good chunk of the loudest people in the chat are just mocking and you know essentially throwing rotten tomatoes at the other person, why would I want to keep doing it? Now, I will say that uh, James is, is, a, is a nice guy and James is starting to take this issue seriously and maybe, maybe the chat will be cleaned up. Maybe we'll also do a better job of finding uh, debate opponents. But for now, until I see a change, I don't think that I'll be doing any more debates at Modern Day Debates. And if that costs me uh, a few dollars, so be it. And if it means that uh, I have to push harder to get my own debate program up in order to have the good conversations, um, then that's just what we're going to do. So that's the nuts and bolts of the debate review. For those out there who might end up doing a debate about prophecy, here's the way to think about all of this. Set aside the modern day debates thing. Set aside the debate that I did. Ask yourself questions for every debate. And for a prophecy debate, it would be this. Here's two statements. How do I know which one of them is prophecy if either of them is prophecy. What are the key features that make a prophetic statement a prophetic statement and not just a statement? Then, of the things that could potentially be a fulfillment of prophecy, what event must occur? How specific does it need to be? How much interpretation should there be? How much leeway should there be? Because if we're predicting something that's incredibly common, like it's gonna rain sometime in the next week, okay, well, depending on where you live, that could be virtual guarantee or shockingly unheard of. 
But if you say it for the whole world, well, it's definitely going to rain somewhere in the next week. It would actually be miraculous if it rained nowhere on earth over the next week. And, and so you have to take a look at how many possible sets of circumstances could result in something that is viewed as fulfilling it. Who could potentially make a claim for fulfilling it? Like how many different uh, messianic figures out there could say, oh, yes, but I spoke to this, you know, and I came in riding on a donkey and I did this. Um, but the last thing is the one that my opponent overlooked and the one that a lot of other people overlook. And that is, how do you know that any of this is true? Because if you have a book that says our Messiah will come forward and be persecuted, okay, well, first of all, that's going to apply to a lot of different people. A lot of different people are going to be persecuted. So you can't then just pick one person that you think was persecuted and say, look, it fulfills this prophecy. Because that could have been for anybody else. But the other thing is, if all you're doing is pointing to a story about someone who was persecuted and claiming that story fulfills this other story, and you have no way to demonstrate that the facts of this story are true, that's like saying, last week I heard about a guy who went to a magic show where the guy sat on stage doing magic tricks, but then he started to read minds and he told this person in the crowd where they were born. And he told this other person in the crowd what they had had for breakfast. And he told this other person in the crowd what the numbers were on their credit card. And it was the most amazing thing this guy had ever seen. And therefore I think this guy has real psychic powers. Now, what you're telling there is a story. You didn't go see a magic show. Somebody you know saw one, which is already way better than you got with the Bible because you don't know anybody who was witness to any of these events. You are now generations uh, removed from all of it. But even in the story that was just told, it's a friend of mine that went to a magic show and they went to a magic show. And in the process, this guy did things that they couldn't explain. And so now the story is so impressive that you think it's supernatural. How else could he have known what the credit card number is? Well, first of all, there's a number of different ways where you could find out that information. But also, did it happen? And the reason I ask this is because go, go talk to any magician who's been performing for any length of time and is remotely aware of what his audiences think and say. And what you'll find is that what the audience describes after the show's over is not only probably in many cases better than what the magician did, it's better than anything they could have done because people tend to embellish and they tend to misremember and they tend to, you know, magicians use a lot of little tricks to make it look like they're far more impressive than they are. Now, somebody's out here going, Matt, Jesus wasn't a magician. This wasn't a show. Your analogy is horrible because this wasn't a show. These were just events that occurred in life. Yes, I realize that I'm not claiming Jesus was a magician. I have no idea whether he did or said any of the things that he supposedly did or said, and that's the point. It doesn't have to be a magician. I like that because that's my background. That's the frame of reference. But the same thing happens when people travel to foreign countries to get special psychic healing. and They go in and people perform psychic surgery on them, and they believe this works because they've heard about other people who've been cured. But have they met anybody who's been cured? And did they examine the scientific medical records of the person who claims they've been cured? And did they look into what other, what other medications or treatments did that person engage in? And so the, the, the issue is always, did it happen at all? Because no matter how cool the story is, the story could be incredibly specific. In this passage of Leviticus, it says, here is a prophecy about our Messiah. He will be this, 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 and this. And then later on, there's something that is, you know, ah, oh, Jesus was this, 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 and this. The question has to be, did it actually happen? Because you have a story trying to fulfill the prophecy of another story. I don't know if I'll be back on modern day debates or not. Uh, it's possible. I don't think it's the most likely set of circumstances. Um, I want to see how this debate goes with Trent Horn, which is not on Modern Day Debates. That's on Pints with Aquinas, and I'll have more information about that for you all coming up soon. Also, there's going to be a patron-only video coming out in the next couple of days, I hope, uh, showing the status of the new studio and everything we're doing moving forward uh, to keep producing monthly regular content for you guys on Atheist Debates and digging in on a number of questions. I, I would give you a sneak preview of the question, but I'm going to save that for the patrons. So thanks, everybody, for your support. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.